You probably have an idea of what a spirometer is or what spirometry is, but just in case you don't, I want to do a quick introduction into just the contraption that we use to measure uh, pulmonary function. Uh, the spirometer is this uh, big contraption seen here, and um, the test is called spirometry. And the test is the most common pulmonary function test, and we use it to measure uh, two different things. We use it to measure, we use it to measure lung volume uh, and we use it to measure the speed of inhalation or exhalation. It's a very useful tool in assessing uh, things like asthma, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis or cystic fibrosis because as the name implies um, we're able to assess pretty well how the lungs are functioning. The spirometer itself is a gas enclosure here. So here we have gas in here. And the gas is surrounded by two bowls, if you will, here. So first one here, the top, and then the next one over here. And between the two bowls we've got some water here to seal this gas enclosure. And this gas enclosure is connected to the patient's lungs through a long tube. Um, this tube is sealed at the mouth so that no other air can enter. And when the patient inhales, the gas is taken out of that enclosed chamber and uh, through the tube and it enters the lungs. When a patient exhales, gas will travel the other direction out of the lungs out of the tube and into the gas enclosure. If we see, uh, we can imagine here that when a patient inhales, this gas that leaves this enclosure will drop the spirometer, will drop this top bowl, and will, through a pulley system, cause this pen down here to rise on the paper. And so we're going we're gonna to get an uptick on the graph. The opposite is true for when a patient exhales. exhales uh, the patient exhales and gas enters the chamber and the bowl is going to rise here and through the pulley system the pen is going to drop on the paper and we're going to get a down tick. The paper that's connected to the pen will be scrolling in time and so we're going to get a picture that looks a little bit like this as a patient inhales and exhales. We're going to be going over all these peaks and uh, how to interpret these um, in just a moment. Let me erase these things here and uh, we'll go over the basic units of the spirometry. We have four basic units of measurement in spirometry and these basic units of measurement are called volumes. We have tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, and residual volume. And different combinations of these volumes will give us different capacities or parameters that we'll be measuring in spirometry. We have vital capacity, total lung capacity, inspiratory capacity, and functional residual capacity. Notice that we have a nice round number for both volumes and capacities with four each. And before we learn to interpret the capacities, uh, interpret the parameters of the spirometry test, we first need to understand the basic measurements and the basic units of measurement and what a spirometry might look like. So let's say we have a patient hooked up to our spirometer and at rest that patient will have somewhere between two and a half to three liters of gas in their lungs. Remember also that as the patient inhales the pen on the paper is going to rise and cause an up uptick in the graph. And as the patient exhales we'll get the opposite. The pen will drop on the paper and we'll get a down tick in the graph. Recall that inhalation is active by increasing the volume in our thoracic cavity. 
We do this through diaphragm contraction and the use of our intercostal muscles. And exhalation, though it can be forceful, is normally um, in everyday breaths a passive endeavor where the elasticity in the lung returns us back to our um, pre-inspiratory volume. So back to the patient. The patient begins at two and a half to three liters of uh, volume and as they inspire, we're taking a normal breath here, they're going to climb towards about four liters of volume in their lungs. And here at the peak we can see that inspiration is finished and the patient will begin to passively exhale, return back to that pre-inspiratory volume and this is going to continue on in a uh, manner something like this, a manner quite like this. Now let's imagine this patient was told uh, or instructed to take as deep a breath as they could, a, as deep an inspiration as they could. And let's say their lungs, being relatively normal, can hold about 7 to 8 liters of gas. We're going to see a rapid rise here to between 7 and 8 liters of gas until they can't take any more air. And then let's say we ask the patient to blow out as much air as they can or expire as much air as they can. We'll see something like this in a normal lung. We'll see the volume uh, drop to between one and a half and two liters um, and then stop. And this is an important thing to point out here. We see um, it, with this phenomenon we see that the lung can never be fully deflated. The lung can never go down to um, zero liters of gas. And then finally let's um, ask the patient to just return back to a normal breathing pattern, a normal breath. So they're going to return back up here and even out. So this is what a uh, relatively normal spirometry will look like. Um, given this is a very short period of time, we're going to have uh, in the clinic a lot longer uh, you know, time strip. But this will help us understand the basic units of measurement. So let's label the volumes here. I'm going to put the volumes here in blue, light blue. And um, we'll do first tidal volume. Tidal volume represents the normal volume of air that's moved in and out of the lungs in uh, normal inspiration and normal expiration. So the tidal volume we're going to see here when we have normal breaths. We'll label this with a TV. The inspiratory reserve volume is the amount of gas that can be taken into our lungs above a normal breath or above an end inspiratory volume. So we're going to see that here when we ask the patient to take as deep a breath as they could. I'm going to label this IRV for inspiratory reserve volume. An expiratory reserve volume, um, as the name implies, is almost the exact opposite. It's the amount of volume in the lung that we can expire or exhale below or beyond a normal exhalation. And this we saw when we asked the patient to take uh, or to exhale as much gas as they could. So I'm going to label this here ERV for expiratory reserve volume. And then finally the residual volume is the volume of gas that's left over in the lung after we've taken or exhaled as much gas as we can. So here we're going to drop it down to zero liters and this final volume is the respite or the residual volume, excuse me. And we can see here how the four volumes will span the entire uh, lung capacity. So let's erase that line and talk about the first capacity. 
The vital capacity is the maximum amount of air a person can expel after maximum inhalation. So we can see that this here is going to be our vital capacity. I'm going to label this VC. And looking at our volumes, we can see that the vital capacity is just a summation of the inspiratory reserve volume, the tidal volume, and the expiratory reserve volume. Total lung capacity, as the name implies, is going to be all that the lung can hold. So I'm going to label this TLC, total lung capacity. And using our volumes, we can see that that's just going to be a summation of all four of the volumes. The inspiratory reserve capacity is going to be the amount of gas we can inspire from rest. I'm going to label that IC here. I'm sorry, inspiratory capacity. And using our volumes again, we can see that the inspiratory capacity is going to be the summation of the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume. And then our last capacity, the functional residual capacity, is just the amount of gas or the volume of gas in the lung after a normal expiration. So let's see here. Here we have completed a normal expiration and this amount of gas is left over in the lungs. So this we're going to call our FRC or functional residual capacity. And using our volumes we can see that that's going to be the summation of the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. So we've covered now the four volumes and the four capacities that we see on spirometry. And getting a firm grasp on these things um, is very important before being able to interpret uh, a spirometry reading. So I encourage you to take a pa uh, piece of paper and a pencil and just uh, draw out a few spirometries uh, for yourself. Don't worry too much about the lung volume or getting the uh, appropriate lung volumes. Just um, really work on integrating what happens when the patient inhales on the spirometer um, and how that translates onto the graph. And then what happens when the patient exhales and how that translates on the graph. And then finally, um, work through all the different, all the four volumes and then how those um, combine to become the capacities. I want to reiterate this again uh, would look a little bit like a normal spirometry. We'll do a few videos a little bit later on what abnormal spirometry might look like and um, how to interpret the different capacities when someone has COPD or asthma or fibrosis or stiffening of the lung.